Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Diana Franklin. Uh, Diana is a tenured teaching faculty and director of the Center for Computing Education and Diversity at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, before that, she got her PhD from UC Davis, and she was an associate professor of computer science at Cal Poly. Um, her interests, among many others, are parallel programming and architecture, computing education, and ethnic and gender diversity in computing. With that, Diana, welcome. Thank you. So today, uh, well, this talk is mainly on my uh, technical research, which is computer architecture. And we're looking at uh, what we call minimal multi-threading, which are is actually three studies that are trying to find and remove redundancy in various areas of parallel processing. So this uh, is the work of a couple of teams. We have our team at UCSB, two students uh, have graduated. And then we did one of the studies jointly with ICT in Beijing, China. And then we're currently working with Lawrence Livermore. And one of the students was from UCSD. So what we did was we looked at what's going to happen with the many core era, as, as everyone here is aware, I'm sure. Uh, through time, the number of cores on a machine has been uh, increasing as it, and is expected to continue increasing. So the question is, what are we going to do? How, how are programmers likely to use that many cores? And then what we sh should we do in the architecture to try to support that use of that many cores? Uh, and so I'm sure we could have many spirited debates about how programmers are likely to use those cores. Uh, oh, and there, there are lots and lots of uh, people who have tried to use all those cores, so we're just one of many groups. So when we thought about, okay, wh how are people going to use these cores? Well, clearly multi-threaded programs. Uh, one thing that we hadn't thought of at first, uh, but in working with Lawrence Livermore, Livermore, it turns out that people that are uh, programming on supercomputers now and have MPI-based uh, programs, they want to put those on many cores, so you'll be, uh, you'll be running many instantiations of an MPI program on the same computer, even though it was designed to be done on different computers. Multi-execution, which I'll explain what I mean by that. And then, of course, uh, those are the three that we're targeting, uh, but there's also concurrent programming uh, and multi-programmed. So, uh, so multi-threaded, probably all aware of, uh, but I want to sort of go through the characteristics because it helps to distinguish what these three paradigms are that we're looking at. So each architectural thread is actually an OS thread, and it shares memory. The different threads share the same uh, virtual memory. So the same virtual address goes to the same physical address, no matter what thread requests it. And the starting state is all of the same, the registers and memory, except for, say, the stack pointer. Okay? And then we used uh, Splash2 and Parsec as benchmarks. All right, so then we looked at uh, message passing architectures. MPI application. So each thread, architectural thread, is actually a separate OS process. So they don't share memory. Uh, so if two MPI threads, well, I'm calling it a thread because at the architecture level, they're just going to be threads of computation. Uh, but at the OS level, it's a process, not a thread. So if two of them access the same virtual address, it does not go to the same physical address. Um, but if you look at the starting state, all of the registers and memory are identical except for however this MPI uh, library has decided to implement uh, just telling you how, what uh, processor number you are. So almost everything is identical. And then uh, we used various benchmarks for, for MPI. The last one is multi-execution, which we made up this word, multi-execution. Uh, but what, what we're referring to are uh, it's actually the same program, but uh, you're running it with different parameters. For example, a simulation. Okay. So uh, at night, Intel um, fires off, you, you've got your latest design of your chip, and you fire off a thousand simulations, all with different test vectors, and uh, you run the same thing, and so it's some, some sort of parameter sweep. Okay. Um, or 
Another one would be, well, I guess this is sort of uh, CAD. So you have to do optimal routing discovery. So you run the same thing multiple times to try to find the optimal route. Um, machine learning, you can do a bunch of training al algorithms in parallel and then accumulate the results at the end. And then actually sort of a cool one is uh, data, data hiding. So what you do is you take a photograph and you encode data in it. What you do is you encode the same data multiple times in different photographs and then you decide which one hid the data the best. Okay, so you have to do the same thing multiple times. Okay. And you might think, well, why don't we just parallelize these? Well, uh, we actually did a previous project that was, that was a parallel computer, and we, and we came up with what well, we, we, we called the John effect, which was one of our students who brought this up. But it, if, you've got, if you have to do separate executables, because of Amdahl's law, it's going to be better to just run them separately than to try to parallelize each one. And so uh, it is actually, if you've got a setup like this, it's better to just run them separately from, uh, from certain points of view. So, so if you look at what this really boils down to, is that each architectural thread is an OS process because there actually, there's no relationship between the different instantiations except that they're running the same program and it happens to be different input values. So it's not the same execution. As some people get confused. They think we're just running the same program again and again. Well, yeah, it's with different input parameters. So it's, there's no shared memory. Um, so the same virtual address is the, a different physical address in each one. The starting st state is identical, except for the memory having to do with the input parameters. And so there are actually several applications in Spec, spec 2000 that are uh, of this nature, and then we also picked from SVM. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we look at these three classes of applications, we wanted to look at the sources of redundancy. So in both multi-execution and in MPI workloads, there's a lot of replicated data. In multi-execution, that's because you start out with identical data, and depending on how the parameter sweep is going and how close the, the parameters are in, in two different executions, uh, it could be that a large part of your large data ends up being the same. And in MPI, because they're expecting to be on different computers that are physically separate with high communication costs, uh, you often have replicated data on all of those nodes. But now that we're uh, running it on a multi-core, core, sure, someone could go in and reprogram it to be more efficient, but actually nobody wants to do it at Lawrence Livermore. So that's... Uh, that's our problem that we'll, we'll look at there. And then in all of the workloads, we have a lot of replicated computations. So it turned, and I'll show an example of why that is. But you can imagine that even in multi-threaded code, uh, again, because we don't want to do fine-grained communication, we end up having a lot, of the a lot of the same code end up running on the different ones, maybe with different data. All right, so we ended up doing three studies that attack these different areas. Uh, and so the first study I'll look at is Mergeable Cache, and we did this on multi-execution workloads, and it was published in ISCA 09. Okay. So we started out by analyzing the replicated data in multi-execution workloads. So we took the application, ran it with two sets of parameters, modeled a one megabyte direct mapped cache, because those colors didn't work out very well, um, and then compared the contents of the cache to see how much replicated data there was. Okay. So it actually varies a lot depending on the application through time. So of course at the beginning it's all the same. But some applications just drop immediately. So Vortex uh, we'll, we'll keep in here because we want to show an application that is not expected to do well. So Vortex drops down to zero fairly quickly. Um, and then we can see AMMP starts out really high and then drops down for the rest of the time. Whereas VPR and TWOLF are the applications we expect to do quite well. All right, so then what, what are we going to try to get out of this? Well, if you look at off, we're going to try to reduce off-chip accesses. We want to use the cache more effectively because, and this is the reason, if, if you run the simulations and you keep doubling the cache size, you can see that the, there's a huge decrease in the number of L2 accesses, so, or L2 cache misses. Okay, so if we were to be able to get down to here, well, there's no point in doing any more. But we'd like to be on this side of the curve instead of that side of the curve. So in an ideal world, we would have our four processes running. 
there's some identical data across them and magically we would merge that into one and we would have all this extra cache space that we could use. Okay, so that's our, that's our large goal. So, so what we really want is a memory architecture that can efficiently identify the data uh, that's identical across multiple processes, merge those identical lines, so we're, we're going to be in the granularity of a cache line, uh, merge those identical lines into a single cache line, provide access to both merged and unmerged lines, and unmerge the lines when necessary, when, when we're going to write to them. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of related work that's, that's trying to do similar problems. I mean, we're just, uh, I just showed some of it, but uh, none that do, well, exactly what we were doing, but a lot that are trying to attack the same problem. I mean, uh, trying to reduce memory stalls, uh, uh, cooperative caching, trying to um, uh, make better use of the cache you have, not through merging, but through uh, stealing from other people, other cores' caches. We've got cache compression, uh, but then you have the overhead of decompression. Uh, and then uh, ca uh, merging in the iCache, which is read-only data, uh, so that you don't have um, replicated data in there. So the way we went about this is we have three tasks we need to do. We need to be able to identify identical data to merge. Of course, we want to do this efficiently. We need to access merged and unmerged data. And we need to unmerge it whenever necessary. Right. So in order to identify identical data, we thought, well, OK, where is the identical data likely to be in the program? Mm -hmm. Let's say we're not going to get all of it. We want to have an efficient way of finding the stuff that's the easiest to find. Okay. Well. As you could probably guess, it's most likely to be at the same virtual address, right? They started out identical. Uh, and so with dynamic allocation, they could end up being in different places. But uh, you have the most likely place is going to be at the same virtual address. Okay? So if we had some cooperation with the operating system to map the virtual pages such that the same virtual address in multiple processes would map down to the same set in the cache, then we would only have to check within the set. We would not have to check all of the sets in the cache. Okay? So that's, that's going to be our trade-off to get our efficient search. Okay? All right. So it turns out that it's really easy to do that. Uh, we, can, uh, we, we did this trick. We just changed the, how we did the mapping of the bits in the cache. So normally, when you look into a cache, we have the tag at the top, the index in the middle, and the block offset at the bottom. But what we want is to have, uh, the, have something be on page boundaries. Uh, or I'm sorry, on, uh, yeah. So we, because the OS is mapping the pages, what we do is we have it be the index does not include the four bits at the bottom of the page number. Instead, uh, those will be the different pages from the, or the same virtual page from the different processes. Okay, so just by making that change in how we address the cache, uh, we can map them all to the same location. As long as the OS sort of, uh, out, so then what that does is let's say there are four bits. That means that these 16 pages that are contiguous in physical memory will the same offset in those will all map to the same set in the cache. And then these 16 will be ending up going to the same set in the cache. And those 16 pages will end up going to the same set in the cache. The same offset in each of those 16 pages anyway. All right, so then how are we going to access the, the merged or unmerged data? Well, for a read, it's trivial. Uh, we, have, uh, we have tags that indicate these, these are the tags, and then we have that PPID, those four bits expanded to 16 because there are 16 choices. And so if you have two, if you have a merged uh, line in here, then two of these bits might be a one. And so all you have to do is you expand the PPID, check the tag, see if, do an or, uh, do an and here, and then check for identical here, and you've got your check. By the way, there, there is a cost of performance cost to doing this, but we won't deal with that quite yet. Okay, so, oh yeah, nice animation. We read. Mm. 
OK, so what do we do on a right? Uh, we have to have it unmerge on a right. Oh, wait, that was not writing the data. I don't know why that said right. Um, OK, oh, yeah, for on a right, then we would um, check. We would read it out. We would check to see if it's identical. And if it's identical, we just add the process flag. If it's not identical, then we give it a new slot and a new process flag and tag. And this only cost. 5.28% uh, power and 4.21% area of a 4 megabyte cache. This, all we really added were the process flags and the CAN. OK, so we actually came up with a nice solution for unmerging the data for writes. That's the challenge. You would have to go in, you'd have to take out the data, set the bit to 0, and then make a new spot and and write in the data all at the same time. So actually, we didn't, didn't end up having to do that because if you're trying to save space in a hierarchy, in a cache hierarchy, um, then the most space effective thing is to not have the L1 cache be inclusive. It's to have them be exclusive. So if a line is in the L1 cache, it's not in the L2 cache, which means you never write to something that's already in the L2 cache. You take it out of the L2 cache and put it in the L1 cache, you write it in the L1 cache, and then when it gets evicted, you attempt to merge it into the L2 cache. So we actually don't have to deal with unmerging things. We, we unmerge not on a write, but on a read. Anytime we read out of the L2 cache, we unmerge it and move it to the L1 cache, and then we attempt to merge it when it comes back to the L2 cache. And you can ask questions at any time. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely had the question eyebrows. So, so if you have multiple cores, um, how do you end up with a cache line in, in multiple L1 caches? So well, they would each have in serial. So let's say we have a merged line. For, let's say we have four cores, and all four of them have it merged in the L2 cache. So the L1 cache wants to access it. So the L1 cache goes and takes its one, so it sets its bit to 0, takes out the one into the L1 cache of process 1. And then processor 3 does it. So it goes in, flips its bit to 0, reads out the data, puts it in its L1 cache. So by the time the fourth one does it, now it's gone from the L2 cache. But you could only have three do it. One, one of the lines is still in the L2 cache. And then when it gets evicted, it attempts to merge. Or if all four of them have it in their caches, the first one to evict, there's no merge. It's the only one. And then the second one to evict attempts to merge when it goes back into the L2 cache. So yes. So if I invalidate something in somebody else's L1 to get it into my L1 so I can modify whatever it is. Ah, so remember that this is not shared memory. Multi-execution and so MPI. That that's right. There are no invalidations because to, to the architecture or to the, yeah, to the cache coherence protocol, there is no cache coherence. These are separate. They're all separate physical addresses, right? Uh, it's just that the cache hardware is trying to merge them if they're identical and specific bits of the address. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. All right, so we have to evaluate our, our idea. We have an out-of-order multiprocessor simulator that could handle up to eight instances of applications. We had had some issues with going beyond that. So this study just goes up to eight instances. Right? So we have private L1 caches that are direct mapped. Uh, and oh, just for reference, we're not doing this with the instruction cache because we're assuming that the OS was smart and didn't actually uh, replicate. For read-only data, there's only one physical page. So we're not, when we say we merge, we don't even count the iCache. The iCache stuff starts merged. It never unmerges. So, and we don't do anything. That, that was the OS that did that. So we don't take credit for that. Um, but the, in the shared L2 cache, we will attempt to merge. Uh, and the, the iCache stuff will, um, could attempt to merge, but it wouldn't be able to merge. Because anything at the same virtual address, or this, the same address would already be the same. OK. All right, so we have various benchmarks. The top ones are all from spec, and then these two are from SVM. 
So we looked at, at three things. Three concepts. One is, is how much does it reduce L2 cache misses? Um, and then the next, well, okay, how much does that actually translate into saving execution time? And then the final one is dynamic versus static merging. The OS can already do static merging. If you start merged, you, you start merged. Uh, an efficient OS will start you merged in the OS and then do a, a copy on write. So are we just overkill? Are we just redoing what the OS already does? And we should just throw this out. Clearly not. But I, just in case there are, we are, have skeptics out there, we will show you that we, what we do does, does help. Okay. So the first one is off-chip chip accesses. And in this case, this is L2, percentage of L2 kit misses, so lower is better. Okay. All right, so with two processes, uh, this is compared to uh, with one process. So 100% is what we're comparing to. Um, so we can see that on the left hand side we get very good scaling so the more processes we have the better we do compared to if we were running it without merging okay so uh, that's that's good because that means that we're able to merge more and more and get a larger effective cache size as we're increasing the size of the problem okay in some cases we get a little bit worse. And, oh, what happened there? OK, so there's a penalty to when I said that we changed where the index was in order to specifically try to map things from the same virtual address into the same spot in the cache. If they don't merge, uh oh, you know, then, then you can have higher conflicts. So this, this does have. At some point, you can get too many lines uh, in the same set in the cache, and you can have an increase in the uh, number of um, misses. So you could, for a, an application that does not scale well, you could turn this off and go back to the original mapping, and then you wouldn't have this problem. OK, so let's look at the execution time. Oh, but it was, it was still better than the original, but Is yeah. Is there turn the mapping off in a on a on a on a, uh, on a on an index by index basis, maybe. Um, no, I don't think so because you wouldn't know where to look then, because the mapping told you which bits to look at for the index. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it would be somebody to think about. Yeah, I mean, it would. So we actually, I'm not showing this, but we actually had another design. That was we split the cache in half, and we had half of it be mergeable, right. and half of it be non-mergeable. Right. And in the non-mergeable, we used the other indexing, the normal indexing scheme, and on the mergeable, we used this indexing scheme. Yeah. And basically, if you were unmerged when you 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 would start out in the mergeable cache, and then if there were too many cache lines in your set, you would be kicked out to the other cache. We actually found that it was not better, which is why I'm not presenting it. We we did the study. We were all excited about it. And then we figured out that we actually do better if you do the, make the whole cache be mergeable. So you mentioned um, adapting dynamically and turning it off uh, in a situation like that, uh, right. by doing VPR with poor scaling. So how would you be able to tell that you're in a situation like that? If you have a lot of conflict misses um, and, 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 you, and you don't have many merges, so you could do sort of a, a check on how many ones there are in the, uh, the split of the PPID. And if they're the same number of ones as there are lines, you've got zero merging. And then if, if that's the case, it's very likely that you're doing worse. And so we, we could have done a sensitivity study and sort of see how much, where the break even point is on how much. And then, but there's a high cost to switching it because once you, if you switch, between mappings, you have to invalidate the whole cache and start bringing stuff in with the other mapping. Or you could, I guess you could theoretically reorganize the stuff inside the cache, but that's probably not too complicated. Very simple, which is just stay with the red number. I mean, don't, don't exceed the associativity of your cache with the number of processes you have. Just let it. Well, don't push it. You know. um, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just well, right. Well, the sure thing is, yeah. it's not quite enough because. Even within one process, multiple things map to the same set in the cache. Sure. So you're still, 
uh, doubling or quadrupling the pressure on that set. That's right. But, you know, so you doubled the pressure on the set from blue to red, and it survived. Itself. For VPR. For VPR. Right. I mean, if, if you had a really oh. poorly behaved application, yeah. theoretically, oh, look at this one, Vortex. See, Vortex. Vortex is our bad one, right? Vortex, Vortex has bad. virtually no merging. And so even from right. two to four. But so what this showed, though, was that even with that, we didn't suffer much, and what we gained is so much better, which is why the half and half cache actually didn't do better. Um, so you barely ever actually lose, because even here with A processes, we didn't lose. We just didn't gain as much as, as maybe we thought we should have. This was a surprising one to us. We were like, hey, wait, but VPR still has merging, but it just has too many conflicts. So if we had 16, if we had been able to simulate to 16 processes, we would start seeing this probably in some of the others. But the other solution to that is to have a hierarchical approach. I mean, by the time we have 32 process cores, we're not going to have a monolithic L2 cache. We're going to say that four processes, processors share an L2 cache. So then you would have the merging happen there, and then your L3 cache might be monolithic. And so then you've, you've made it so that you only share four ways each time in some, some sense. OK. So let's look at the execution time. In this case, higher is better. So we're going to expect that, again, the applications on the left are expected to do better, uh, and then on the right are expected not to do better. So you can see that Vortex, not surprisingly, had a slight slowdown. Um, but the, the ones that behave well get a huge increase in, execute, in speed up, because, of course, L2 cache misses are very painful. So it is a, definitely a big deal to, ha to reduce those. And we weren't even using sophisticated. There's been a lot of research on the LRU algorithms in the L2 cache, and we did not integrate any of that. So presumably, if you integrated that, uh, you could even do better. Okay. OK, so now what about um, static versus dynamic merging? If we had just done the OS's start out merged, is this really just read-only data? Um, so what we did was we took snapshots of the cache at different points and calculated how many things were merged, how many things were dirty, uh, so they had been touched before, and how many things were clean. So if we, across all those snapshots, we saw that if, if we had a lot of yellow, then we would be thinking we weren't doing very well. Uh, but it turns out that we do have mostly green, uh, which means that these lines were touched before they were merged. So yay, we, so we did something that was useful. <laughs> does that mean that they're touched in the same, they're written in the same way? And so when that's right. They're, they're that's, identical when yeah. that's when right. you do a successful That's right. So, so it could be that it's write once data, but the OS wouldn't be able to figure that out. A programmer could figure it out. But again, our, what we were thinking of was, well, how can we, given that a lot of this, you it's a cache line granularity, so maybe part of the data structure is not identical, but part of it is. So some of this would be too complicated for a programmer to figure out, or to the programmer has to guarantee the whole data structure is the same, and maybe it's not. Yeah. I'd be interested to know how many of those yellow cases actually started out life being God knows what. I mean, you could allocate space on the heap and write constant data to it and get this effect with no, I mean, it's true they were merged beforehand, I guess, in that case. But I mean, it, it's, the question is, you know, did, did it ever reverse, I guess? Uh, Where it was... They used to be different, but now they're not. Oh, well, oh, you mean, right, so they, well, they start out the same, and then they got written with different values, well, that's one and then right. get written with the same values again, right. Yeah, that's really hard to, to figure hard out, to but measure. yeah, yeah, hard to measure, yeah. right, right. Yeah. But of course, that would be the, the best argument for this, right? Yeah, sure. So this was our attempt at trying to understand. But yes, it doesn't show the whole picture. That's definitely true. OK, so if you look at the mergeable cache, what did we find out? Well, uh, merging even limiting merging to the same virtual address, it was quite successful. Um, clearly, or not clearly, but I imagine it would be even more successful if we didn't have that limitation. But the hardware would be significantly more complicated. 
Uh, and it does improve performance by a lot. So we were happy about that. So when we talked to Lawrence Livermore, they were really excited about this. But they said, well, our problem and the problem of scientific labs like ours is actually the page granularity um, because they don't use virtual paging. They, they have all of their runs have to be in DRAM. And if you exceed the DRAM space, that's it. That, that's too big of a problem and they won't run it because they find that paging is just way too slow and they don't, won't allow it. Um, and so they wanted us to do it at the page granularity. Um, and so that's what I'll show next. And that's when we started looking at MPI programs. So this study now is only MPI programs. And in fact, they are sort of, I think some of them are proprietary uh, programs or they're also running proprietary programs and then won't tell us. They would say, oh yeah, that did really well but we can't tell you how it did or anything about the application. So we had to uh, restrict what, what we showed uh, to only public ones. Um, and we had, we had trouble matching the public ones performance to what they were telling us the secure ones did. So that was a little disappointing. But anyway, the, the challenge here is that, that they're not gonna do paging to disk. And so what they're really talking about is a hard limit. Instead of saying, well, I'd like to minimize the amount of cache space I'm using. It's really just, I want to stay below a threshold. And as long as it stays below that, then that's great. Um, but the challenge is that if you go to a page size granularity, you can imagine that a lot fewer pages are going to be the same than cache lines. Uh, detection is incredibly high overhead because we're going to have to do it in software. Um, and check the whole page. And what they wanted was a user-level library because th there, it, there actually are some OS things that will do this with programmer help, um, but they're not in control of the OS. And most people using supercomputers are not in control of the OS. So they wanted a user-level library that would do that, that anybody, uh, any scientist in the world could use for their supercomputers or network of workstations or whatever that they were using. Okay? So that was the challenge that we faced. So first we looked at, okay, well, is there potential for this? Is there, are there a lot of uh, replicated four kilobyte blocks? That's what we considered the page size. Uh, so is there even any opportunity for this? So if you look at the, um, if you just run the program, that's how many four kilobyte blocks are allocated at various times. And if you look at the number of unique blocks, you see that it is below the number of blocks. So that means that these are all replicated in some way. So yes, luckily there is some room uh, for merging. Okay? So if we look at, and AMG is another one of our apps, if you look at, well, let's say all of those unique ones were merged. Or no, non-unique ones were merged. So if we merged all of the non-unique pages to make it the minimum number of pages, what problem size would we be able to run uh, in the computer? So with, with a certain, how many nodes would we need? Because each node gives you more memory. So the question is, uh, to run these problem size, sizes, how many nodes do you know, want where the memory in the node is the limiting factor? And so you can see that if you only had to store the unique pages very quickly, you start doing very well. So at the beginning, it doesn't matter. We have plenty of space. And then all of a sudden, we've exceeded the memory, but we're able to stay in one node, whereas uh, if you have all the pages, it has to go to two nodes. Okay? So does this make sense? Yeah. Sorry, what, what is a node in this context? Uh, it what might is... be multi-core. It it's, it's, a, it's a computer. So it's a, um, it's, it might be a network of workstations. So a lot of the supercomputers nowadays are networks of workstations. And so it's the, whatever the processor looks like, plus it's, yeah, it's set of DRAM. And then the MPI is communicating uh, between them, but in this you can also have, in, in each node, there are multiple MPI processes. So it's basically uh, limiting how many MPI processes you can put on one node because they all allocate data. Um, and so then you have to go to a second node to get enough data to do these sizes. So you're looking at sharing pages within, uh, within node. a node. Okay. That's right. Within a node between different MPI uh, instantiations of the program. Any other questions? Okay. So 
we were trying to understand where this comes from because we were actually surprised. We thought this is going to be impossible. You know, there, there's, there. I, I was very skeptical. I thought there's not sharing between pages. Uh, I mean, that's just too big. So one, so in AMG, one of the data structures was write once. So that one um, did never changed after that. But then there were three data structures uh, that were. Um, that actually did change more than once. This is a very complicated graph, so I'll show you what's going on here. So these are uh, sort of a set of memory addresses starting with the beginning of that data structure. So there were three data structures that, other than the write once data structure, that were uh, contributing to the merging. And what happens is every time you see uh, a blue, so as time goes by, um, things happen, and then the blue is the merging. So a blue before a black means that it started, that's the initial merge. Okay. So that means that in, in one merge operation, it's going through and checking all these pages and merging all these pages. And then this is a second merge operation because it happened a little later. And what you see is the black line is writes that are happening. So they happen through time. You can't do multiple writes at the same time. But you can do multiple merges at the same time because that's, um, that happens in, an, in the malloc call. So no writes happen in between. Uh, okay, so, so what happens in this data structure is that it starts out identical and then at some point it goes through the entire data structure writing something, but it's all writing the same thing. So it's going through it, going through it, going through it. So it starts out merged and then it starts unmerging as it writes to it. And then at some point it's, it allocates enough memory that triggers, triggers the merge operation. So then it merges these pages. And then it keeps writing, keeps writing, keeps writing, keeps writing. Triggers the merge operation again, it merges these, and then merges these. Okay. So this one actually, um, the writes happen, and only some of them can be merged after that. Notice that these ones weren't merged. So those were writing different things, but these were writing the same things. Such. So, um, and then that one has some various, those are, that's black and blue up there. So that means that it was again writing the same thing, but it was, had allocated enough memory that those writes right away triggered merge operations. Okay. So, yeah, it's sort of that big blue line and the vertical line in the middle, the longest vertical yeah. blue line in the middle. That's a massive merge operation. It is, and it's interesting because the writes that led to it are pretty far to the left of it. They're over there in 130 or something. Right. So, so the trick here is when do you merge, right? That I, it sounds like that's the question you're asking is what? So why did it, why was it so late? Why was it so late? Um, it's because well, so this only shows the writes that are happening in, in those three data structures. Other writes are occurring as well. Other allocations are occurring. So, the Checking to see if you can merge is incredibly expensive. It takes M remap, you have to map it into shared space, you have to check it against the other ones, and then maybe map it back. So it's incredibly expensive. So in this case, and we don't care about minimizing our footprint, we care about keeping our footprint under a threshold, right? So what we do is we, we have a trigger point. We have, when, when the allocation gets above this point, we will attempt to merge. And then if you merge a lot, then you have a lot more time before you get to that point again. And so it all depends on when you get to that trigger point. So it, it's very possible that it's, you know, all that time later, some other rights were happening in allocations. So it kind of sounds like when, when do you activate garbage collection? Yeah. It, it's very, yeah. So in a sense, this is like garbage. It's MPI garbage collection. That's right. Redundancy so collection. Applying some of those techniques and some of those uh, decision mechanisms into That's an excellent idea. We, we didn't actually do that um, because, well, ours is a user level, so our only, the only thing we can do, we did a malloc library, so we only have, we can only do it at malloc calls, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure the same, a lot of the same algorithms could be used. Okay, so this shows another application, and again, this is, it's going through the whole, it's, it's going through a lot of writes, um, going through the whole data structure, merging and unmerging. So we had, had, so we had several applications, and so what we did was made, made an allocator, um, and, and we only attempted to merge dirty pages, because if it's clean, 
it's been checked before and it hasn't changed so it's either merged or unmerged but we shouldn't touch it so we only attempt to merge dirty pages um, and then uh, we have a read-only mode so that we can trigger ourselves more often than just allocation so sometimes when you touch a page then it triggers us to look to check for merge opportunities um, the user sets the trigger point to be a percentage of available memory um, and then uh, when when it triggers that threshold the it's the percentage of available memory right a physical memory so when it hits that point that triggers the merging and then we allow slightly more allocate if we keep that threshold all the time then it triggers too often so we start at that threshold go a little higher go a little higher um, obviously never going above 100 percent or not quite can't go even quite near 100% because we need some of the memory too. So, uh, like I said, the merge process is very high overhead, so that's why, uh, why we are careful about when we'll try to merge. So, this is, um, so we did these experiments with a pin-based system to get the analysis, but, the, um, but it is actually implemented, the, the allocation routine. So that's a little small, but there are lots of benchmarks. The, these are the public benchmarks we used, and then another set of private ones that even I don't know about because I don't, I've, I don't have clearance to look at them at the moment. So I don't know about the other applications. Okay. So there were sort of three, uh, three interesting things to look at here. One is zero page contribution, which an OS could do itself, actually. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we weren't just doing zero pages. Uh, and then there's this trade-off between memory reduction and runtime. So in order to show the sort of potential of how well we can do in terms of memory reduction, I'll show the memory reduction results, which is the maximum memory reduction we can get, but isn't just trying to stay below a threshold. Um, and then they sort of show the trade-off between memory reduction and runtime. Whoa. What happened? Okay. It exited me from the talk. Okay. I don't know why I did that. It's just going to do that when I get to that slide again. Come on. Maybe I'll just I'll just make this really big. Okay. So in one application, uh, no, in in AMG. Uh, as one of our applications, you can see that at the beginning, there are a whole lot of zero pages. But very quickly, the, they start writing to these pages, and then zero pages are a fairly small contribution. So it is not the case that we're getting all of our performance based on just zero pages. Okay. All right, so let's look at uh, um, a AMG. And look at this trade-off between memory savings and runtime. So we use two trigger points here. Uh, one is to trigger at 40, starting to trigger at 40% of the total memory. And then the other one is to have sort of an absolute, <coughs> we're going to trigger at 8 gigabytes regardless of how big the problem size is. So we start out uh, and the runtime, you can see that the runtime of the 40% is the best because as we get bigger and bigger that delays the trigger points later and later okay and as we can use uh, more nodes so what we ended up with was then here we get to the point where if you don't use merging you run out of memory so this illust shows that we actually do make it so you can run on the same set of memory the same number of nodes you can run larger problem sizes than you could before and it also still shows that the 40% trigger gets a lot better performance than having an absolute trigger. Okay. 
it's the, oh, I'm sorry, that's memory usage, not execution time. That's memory usage. Sorry about that. So, so the 40%, so ignore everything I just said. Different explanation. So the 40% saves more memory because it gets triggered earlier. And whereas the 8 gigabytes waits until we get up near the 8 gigabytes. So that's why it doesn't save any memory if we don't need more than 8 gigabytes. And then you can see here we start hitting 8 gigabytes and then it starts to kick in. Okay, so. Flush. It, that's right. And it's not versus runtime. Well, it's my fault. I did that because it's, it's over two slides that we're showing. Now, now we're showing runtime. So now you keep the other one in mind as to uh, what was happening. So the 40% was giving a lot more savings. But if you look at the run times, you can see the 40% took a little bit. Boy, that's really hard to see. OK. Eh, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's fine. Working, it's working not. Working hard. It's trying that's to right. All the time. Yeah, but it's right. And so that's why it's taking more time um, pretty much all the time. So, so if you have an absolute threshold, uh, then you actually save time because then you don't trigger it until. And, and you could have a 70%, 40% is just way too early, right? Why should you start merging if you're using less than half the memory? So it's just to show that trade-off. Yeah. All right, so now show, show that trade-off in another way. So here's the trigger threshold as a percent of the default footprint so that we can show uh, uh, different sizes. So, so this is the trigger point, and then we have the execution time and then the percentage, this is the memory usage. So now we're plotting memory usage and execution time together. Okay. So what we see is that on the left, when the trigger threshold is very early, then the execution time with the default, well, the execution time with the default allocator is always the same. But uh, the memory footprint keeps going up because our threshold keeps going up. But the execution time keeps going down because we attempt to merge less often. Okay. But as long as we're keeping our memory below um, what the machine has, it's not useful to be over here. But maybe we would say, well, here, this looks like, like a good spot because we have good savings, but our execution time has come down a lot. So you would pick some spot where you would say, oh, this is a good sweet spot. as much memory as you can, like being at the 94, so 94%. 94 is a little tricky because, like I said, the way, if you, if you keep the threshold the same the whole time, then you, if you try to merge and you're unsuccessful or you don't merge much, then you allocate only a little bit more and it triggers, triggers the merging again, which is very expensive. So every time, it's, it's more efficient to start merging a little earlier and then increase the threshold 5% each time. But wouldn't, you ha wouldn't that show in the execution time? Or, or this is particular to well, this example and other examples will, will do worse? This, is, this now took 100% of the memory footprint, even though we triggered at 94. So you ended up taking more of the footprint than what the trigger is. So, but okay. yeah, okay. I, so, so I mean, you have a good point that there, there's, it appeared, like, why would you ever want to be? back here. So, so the risk you run into is essentially exceeding the size of memory and then your application <coughs> crashes. Right, you right, really can't right. And, and the thing is that this is just one instantiation, this is one application, one sort of graph. And it, it got cumbersome, I mean we could graph all of them and run this on all of them, but it sort of just got cumbersome and, and we didn't want to flood with graphs and data. And so we sort of said, oh well let's you know, look at this and try to see where the, the angles look good. But, um, and this is the default footprint, not the available memory in the machine. So, yeah, um, if, so if you were just trying to pick a good, uh, yeah, if you're just trying to keep it on the machine, it would be with the machine's 
amount is, right? That's what you would pick. You would pick a fairly high threshold. If you're trying to look at getting this trade-off between savings and execution time, then this is what you would look at. So you're right. If you're just trying to stay below an absolute line, you want the threshold to be right below that. Okay, so if you look at the, the potential for memory reduction, uh, then some, some of them do not do well. Like we're getting very little merging, which gives a sort of reality. Okay, we're not just making stuff up. Yes, we have bad applications, we are showing you. Uh, but a lot of the applications have a huge amount of savings. If you're willing to pay the execution time, right? It's a trade-off. And so what, what Lawrence, oh, I know why. Oh, OK, OK, I have an answer. This slide, I remember now. Um, because you can execute on more nodes if you want to. So there's, there's this trade-off where um, you don't have to, there actually is a sweet spot. Because if you try to run on the same node and not expand at all, then your execution time keeps going up and up and up. Right, because you're, you're trying to merge more and more and more. So it might be that at some point you say, OK, well, why don't we put this on two nodes? At what point should we say, OK, let's go on to two nodes? And that might be the point, where your execution time is going up faster than the memory usage is going down. Okay, There we go. Does that make sense? OK. All right, so this is sort of the maximum savings in memory footprint, but of course this represents the highest execution time. So you would want to find the trade-off that you want. Okay. All right, so then there's the obvious question, well, what if you do have paging? Are we totally useless if you have paging? So what we did is we looked at, okay, let's increase the problem size, but when we run out of memory, let's do paging instead. Okay, that didn't seem like a very good idea. So the paging was, in fact, really awful in terms of execution time. And so let's not do that. <laughs> so we, we do, even in a system with paging, uh, what we do does make sense. Because we're less expensive than paging all the time. I'd like to make yeah. a trivial point about that. If you have a large number of MPI nodes yes. that are all counting on each other to make progress, maybe there's a barrier somewhere at the bottom, page faults cause outliers and outliers, right. so, so it, it's really, it isn't the bandwidth uh, diminution or anything like that. It's just the fact that you have to wait for the page faults to. Okay, there's started. also that. Actually, the Lawrence Livermore people said it was a cost. There was some cost thing. The disks are very far away. I mean, the that, nodes that don't have the disks. the problem. But yeah, even yeah. If they're, even if right. they're solid state and bolted right to the Right, processor, right, that's true. If you ever heard the phrase OS noise from those people, Okay. This is ultimate OS noise. It's right. page fault. Okay. Thank you. I was, I was afraid you were going to make a trivial point that wasn't trivial, that was like against everything we were doing. But thank you for, no, no, for in fact, adding to my story. Just yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So one thing we said was, okay, uh, what this is doing is it's saving nodes. So, and it is, is true. So this shows that as the... Um, Oh yeah, so this is that trade-off between execution time and number of nodes saved. So the execution time with 128 nodes is 400. And so uh, if you want to save no nodes, then we don't have to merge very often. And then you can uh, you see that it as you increase the number of n savings you get, then you also increase the execution time. Yes. Asking this a little bit after to change the subject, but uh, so we're talking about whenever we go to uh, paging, we're going to suffer very much. Okay. So we're sort of uh, we want to guarantee that we always remain uh, under a limited amount. So the thing is, how much variety do you see? Uh, how much sort of variance do you see uh, in program behavior across different executions? Oh, different executions of the same program. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't actually know because we had we had inputs for the uh, benchmarks, but I don't know. In this case, th this isn't multi-execution, so we weren't running the problems with different inputs each time. 
It was a single MPI uh, run using the, the benchmarks inputs parallelized. So I actually don't know what the variance is if you were to change the inputs. I see. So yeah. uh, you see, because sometimes, uh, you know, maybe 90% of the times you can stay uh, below the virtual memory, and other times you can just go beyond. Now, the thing right. is, if they are, they are sort of uh, exhibiting in some sort of stable behavior, then maybe also profiling could be an alternative solution also. I mean, you profile it, you save it as hands, and then you make, you make minimum current, a very you know, small number of kernel. Ah, uh, see, you said the magic word kernel changes, though. And, and supercomputing labs, they, they don't want anyone making kernel changes, right? What you could do is you could theoretically do shared pages in your MPI jobs, um, and, and that's true. They could do that, but these are scientists doing the programming, not programmers. It's not CS people, and they don't want to do that. They have their MPI programs that were, were written a while ago. So there are actually lots of solutions that involve reprogramming that they could solve a lot of these, especially at the page level. I mean, I can argue with the cache granularity that that would be really tough to do, even with a sophisticated programmer. At the page granularity, I don't think you need, I, I agree. You, there are programming solutions. There are certainly kernel solutions. Um, and depending on what OS you run, they're already in there if the programmer is willing to give hints. Because their overhead is way too high if they check every page. And so they want the programmer to tell them what pages to check. What if you do that through using profile? Right, right, you could do that. That's right. So this is just an, an alternative. This is not the only, definitely not the only solution. This is just a user level solution that doesn't require any programmer help or an, anything like that. But I completely agree, yes. Uh, profiling would help you give the hints if you were running the right OS that already had it. That's definitely true. Uh, okay, so um, there is, so, this is scheduled to go till noon, right? Am I supposed to stop talking before then? Or because I have the fun one last. The one I like the, this is the preliminary work that I really like. So do you want me to how are you guys on time? Are you itching to get out of here or are you okay? Okay. So now we're looking at the processor. And when we when you do parallel processing, a lot of times it looks like the same Com computation just on different data a lot of times. Uh, so let's look at this example. So you might think, well, but it's all different. Well, not, not quite. Um, so, oh, yeah, so none of the animations are going because I'm not in the, OK. So if you look at this, it's, it's true that in, in this code, no matter what happens, everybody is running these instructions. OK, so they're fetching those instructions. And some subset of, subset of them are fetching that instruction. But they're all fetching these instructions, and all of those instructions are identical. In addition, the loop uh, variables are being executed identically across all of them as well. Right? So it turns out there's a lot of circumstances like this in both uh, in multi-execution MPI and multi-threaded codes where uh, there's a lot of stuff that's fetched identically, and then some subset of that in even the input values are identical. So what we'd really like to do uh, is be able to exploit that. So if you look at, we looked at, so these ones are multi-execution over to VPR, and then ocean on are multi-threaded. Okay, so these are the same multi-execution benchmarks from before. And what we find, anything that's execute identical is also fetch identical. So what you find is that um, a very high percentage of them are fetch identical which means they were same instruction was fetched. And then various amounts of subsets were actually I executed identically as well with the same inputs. So we would really like to exploit this at the instruction level. Okay? So first we looked at, well, what happens when they get to a branch and go different directions? How different is the length of those paths? How likely is it that they're going to come back at about the same time? Okay? So what we have here is uh, a histogram, not a histogram, but so the percentage that are 16 or less, the leftmost bar. 
So 16 instructions or less difference in path length. And then 32, 64, 128, and so on. So you can see that in Vortex, the path lengths are quite different. So once again, Vortex, we do not expect to do all that well. That, that will be a challenge. Um, but a lot of the applications, the difference in length of the different paths is quite close. So we would expect that they'll come back to the same path relatively similar times. Okay. Maybe not the exactly, exactly the same, same time. But we, were, we thought, OK, this is close enough that we can try to propose something. So the solution from 10, the, the high level solution is uh, we want to merge the fetch whenever the PCs are the same. And we want to encourage the PCs to be the same by manipulating the fetch when they're diverged. Okay? Um, fetch priorities. Okay. And then in order to do fetch identical, we want to keep track somehow of what registers contain the same values um, so that when we get to the register alias table stage, then if if the inputs are identical, we'll give them the same physical register as an output. Okay. So we'll just, and then it can be executed once. And everybody uses the same physical register, so we don't have to write it to multiple places. Um, yeah, so that's the high level solution. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, related work. There's actually one that's quite related that was concurrent with ours. Uh, they, they published those a little before. Um, and they do fetch, they fetch identical and on an in-order processor, whereas we do fetch and execute identical on. And they required uh, pro, uh, compiler support, whereas ours, ours is entirely hardware only. Uh, that's that's the model we're trying to go for, uh, which of course will will make it so that we we have some challenges. But um, and then if, there's lots of work on trying to sort of take advantage of, of previous things the processor has done. So I didn't list it all, but I mean, it's, it's all, all could be used in conjunction. Okay? So let's say we have two threads with slightly different paths. So they have an if-else statement, and they go in different paths. So just from some terminology that I'll be using. So in the beginning, they're in sync. They are merged. Then when they go on different paths, we consider that diverged. And then they're out of sync. They might come back, but they can, might come back at different times. So even they're, though they're executing the same instructions, uh, they're not executing them at the same time. And of course, there's an animation that shows, that shows this nicely. Um, and then at some point, the, th the threads catch up. And so now they're in sync again, and they could potentially merge their fetch again. So when they're not in sync, which means they're on the same path, but uh, they're not fetching together, we want to detect that. So what happens is as you, every time you hit a branch, you put your branch target into the fetch history buffer. And then two threads that are diverged, one thread looks to see if its target is in the other one's table his, fetch history buffer. And if it is, that means you're trailing that other one. Okay, so then you say, okay, well, let's, uh, let's try to catch up. And you slow the fetch of the one that's ahead, and you increase the fetch of the one that's behind. So you just give it more fetch slots. Okay. So if you look at this, is it really not going to let me start here? Please let me start there. No, OK. All right, well, so you can see here that at the beginning, they're merged. So up here, they're merged. And then when they diverge, they go into diverge mode, which is when we detect. We, we start looking in the branch history table for the, the branch targets to be in the other table. And then once they're detected, we go into catch up mode, where we manipulate the fetches. And then we start fetching together again. Okay. So it's just a simple state machine and a fetch history buffer and manipulating the fetch priorities. So that's our, how, do, how we do the fetch. Now, how do we handle the execution of a merged instruction? So when we fetch it, depending on how many threads there are, we only did four, um, there is a four-bit tag. And so you just set a one for each thread that fetched that instruction. Right? And then uh, if you have to flush something for one or more of the threads, you could just set those, that bit to zero 
in a bunch of the instructions. Uh, and if the inputs aren't the same, you split the instruction prior to the register renaming stage. So, okay. Um, all right, so in order to keep track of what registers are identical, we have what's called the register sharing table. So it just contains, we could do this all in the register alias table stage, but that's one of the limiting factor in, in the clock cycle time, and so we decided that we could not do it in the same stage, even though theoretically we could. In reality, we couldn't. So we made a separate table that, instead of containing the register mapping, just contains a one or a zero as to whether uh, if it's a one, that means the register mapping is the same, or I'll, I'll show it, or it means that we've figured out that those I values are identical, even though the register mapping is not the same. Okay, um, but we have to do this before that stage because we don't we don't get to read the registers and see if they're the same before we have to do the split. So we have to we have to keep track of this beforehand. Okay, so if all of the input registers have that value for that pair or whatever set of threads, then you execute it merged. If not, then you split them, which means just replicating the instruction and splitting out those uh, bits. Um, and then if it's a split instruction, then in the table you set zero as to, to say now they're not shared. Or if it's a merged instruction, then you set it to a one saying, okay, this, this output is now going to be shared. That's a nice animation too. But, um, okay, so there are, there are two slight complications. One is that uh, for multi-execution and MPI workloads, they have non-shared memory, which means that if you're loading, even if the virtual address is the same, the actual physical address is different. So you can't actually merge the loads. So we, in the table, we can say, oh, these are the same, but when we get to the LSQ, it has to, to actually do two loads and then it can verify whether they were correct. And if they were not correct, you're going to have to roll back and do the instruct. If you, so, um, uh, yeah, if you assume that they were going to be the same and they're not, then you have to roll back to that point and start, start again. Okay? The other problem is that when they're diverged or when they're catching up, you might actually be executing instructions that are writing to the same destination register and the same value but you're not going to know it, and so you're going to conservatively say, oh yeah, that destination is different, so then later instructions that use those as inputs are going to assume they're different. And so you can have this problem that the table gets out of date with lots of zeros in it, and now everything is unmerged. Right. So those are our two complications. So what we'll do for the loads is we'll have a predictor. We'll say, okay, is this have we seen this instruction before? Did the load come back the same way before? Do we think these are going to be the same values? Uh, and so at least that will give us fewer rollbacks. And then for register merging, uh, we're going to, if we're in a diver mostly in catch-up mode, but sometimes in diverge mode it might be useful as well. Um, if you're writing to a register and uh, there's no register in the pipeline currently that's also right into that same register. You can check it against the other physical registers for the same architected register of your thread friends. And if it's identical, you can set that bit back to one. It's not perfect because you can't have multiple in-flight instructions right into that register. So, but for a subset of the instructions, we can clean up that and, and get more. So, Summary of the changes, we added these bits, we added a predictor so that we know whether to do loads merged or not within the pipeline. Uh, register sharing table tells us which registers are, the, the same, are guaranteed to have the same value. And then the issue queue, you split it, so if they're not the same, we split into two instructions. There's no change to the register file except for outside the register file, you would have to do the register merging, read when it's not being used. If some ports are free, you can read things in and update the RST. But the ALU has no changes, and the LSQ has to know to split loads and stores if it's not shared memory. Okay, this does require OS support. It has the gang schedule. It has to, when you're, if you're doing four threads for the same process, or uh, four, 
for processes that are multi-execution, you do have to start them at the same time. You have to set the register alias table or register sharing table to say that they're all identical. Uh, so things like that, it does have to know about that. Um, when you context switch, we haven't done a study on this, but it might make sense to switch everybody out at the same time if they're merged so that they stay merged when they came, come back. Um, OS calls, you might need a barrier after some OS calls because maybe one, only one can do it at the same time and they might each go through it and you might want them merged at the, when you come back. So we haven't done a study on the, the OS implications. This is just an initial study. Okay, so let's just look. Okay, so let's look at the speed up with two threads. So we have a few configurations. We have our base configuration that's just normal SMT. Then we do just the thread shared fetch shared fetch and shared execution, and then we add register merging. Okay. So we can see that uh, the multi-execution workloads in general do better than the uh, multi-threaded workloads, but not entirely. So here's the cutoff, especially when we add the execution. So we can see that actually the multi-execution workloads are much more likely to have completely identical instructions, both the fetch and the execution. Um, but we did get gains with everybody. So these are the multi-threaded, and this is only two threads. Oh, we didn't get, wait, we, I don't think we got gains with everybody, sorry. Let me see. Not much here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider that big gains. But we didn't lose out except we did take extra hardware. Okay, so let's look at, at uh, four threads. So now the gains, the, I think the scale is different. So just because it got smaller doesn't mean it got worse. So then we can see that we got even more, uh, slightly more benefit with four threads. Um, so if you compare the graphs of what was the potential versus what we actually got, you can see that some of them we did quite well. Here, we got pretty much all the potential. Uh, in, um, but some of them we really didn't. So Vortex, that was because the distances, when it, when it diverged, the path lengths were so different that our fetch history buffer wasn't big enough to capture it when it came back together. Um, so, okay. And if you spend too much time in catch-up mode, you slow down the execution. So there is a, a potential disadvantage to this because you've manipulated the fetches for no reason. Okay. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to think about catch-up. I've been musing about using run ahead as a way to catch up. Using what? Run ahead. Oh, a, a speculative run ahead thread or? Yeah, yeah, or? yeah, yeah. In other words, when you say, oh, my, I'm, I'm trailing behind this other guy. Why don't I spawn a run ahead or fire off a run ahead, let it go cruising after that guy. And that'll accelerate me. Right, so I'll it would... I'll essentially be applying that's a, right. a little bit of concurrency to my catch-up problem instead of slowing the other thread down. So an I have no idea whether that's that right. Works. So that's an interesting idea. So the, the advantage of a run-ahead thread is the memory operations, right? You bet. So one yeah, way we could... do actually have to happen. Yeah, that's right. Just, well, so the, the interesting thing about that is, is we could consider the other thread, the run-ahead thread. What about if we well, fetched... Yeah, yeah, yeah both loads even when it wasn't in merged mode. Ooh, that's wild. Oh. It makes your, yeah, so this is. Yeah, that, I, we didn't think about that, but that is an excellent idea. I yes. Don't know if it is or not, but it's certainly. Well, well, hard. it's an excellent idea. It doesn't mean it's yeah. going to pan out, it work, right? but nice. Okay, yes. Uh, so we actually got really big uh, energy consumption savings because not only are you using fewer resources because you're executing fewer instructions, but then you you're also completing faster. So, and you're doing fewer cache operations. So you're saving in a lot of other, a lot of areas. What was funny was one of the applications had higher power requirements because it was using the machine so much more efficiently. But all the, all the rest of them actually were lower power and lower execution time. Uh, okay, so it is sensitive to the number of load store queues. You get more, or ports, the more uh, ports you have, the more speed up you get. And the small, the bigger the fetch, the less speed up you get. And that's because if there's sufficient fetch, then you don't need the merged fetch. So if you have a lot of resources, then this doesn't help you. All right, so MMT removes redundant fetches. 
Uh, there's no programmer in intervention. It checks the instruction inputs, uh, manipulates the fetch, and we're pretty happy with how we did. Okay. So, all right. So I'll open it up to any any other questions, or did you ask them during the talk? Good question. Yeah. So the last work is really interesting, um, and I'm, I'm quite interested in how to you know extend this one to a scenario you don't have access to. <laughs> Suppose you have CMP, I you know. have all threads. We just had Dean Tolson visit. He was like, oh, you can't publish things that only work on SMTs anymore. Like, I don't know. We Somehow we slid this one in and, and got it published in Micro this year. But um, yeah, we're, that is what we're thinking about. How it, The problem is it really depends on, I mean, the whole, I think the clever thing about this idea was exploiting the register alias table. And you can't do that on a CMP. And so... The, it, it, we are sort of trying to think about um, can we do this on a CMP with some other clever trick. I mean, there has been a lot of CMP work a long time ago, sort of with speculative stuff, trying to communicate through registers and different cores. So I, um, it's just really a question of can we come up with something that's sufficiently different and works better than you know the work people have done previously. You know, you show a graph like shows like um, identical execution paths, the same. So the histogram for that. It seems most of it's quite short, right? It's less than sixteen instructions or something. The that's the difference in the path. That's the difference. Difference yeah, in the path. That's so right. in terms if we do that the different way, probably the identical path is pretty long. Yes. So probably can do something like in CMP. Right, it's, yeah, it seems there's some SIMD aspect to this, right, yeah, sure. where everybody's executing, but without needing to have a SIMD programming model. So that's really the thing is can you get the advantage of SIMD without having to have the programmer do anything special, sort of. Yeah. And to get the execution, too. That, that's the tricky part, too, is, is, you know, we like the idea of getting the execution, but then who does the execution? and then you have to transmit the results to everybody. I mean, by sharing the physical register, we really only had to do it once. So then it gets a little trickier with CMP. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. Thank you. Speaker. Oh, yeah. We just used